Okay, so I'm going to talk about surgery, and um, uh, first of all, I'd like to give an introduction to kidney cancer, uh, become a first speaker about kidney cancer today, and so a little bit about kidney cancer before we go into the uh, surgical uh, management of kidney cancer. About 5,000 new cases per year in Canada, and about 30,000 new cases per year in the United States. The incidence is increasing over time, uh, and for un uh, unknown reasons, but mainly because of a detection bias. That means we're picking up a lot of these tumors by accident over time. Many patients come in just for a CAT scan for a, or ultrasound for a gallbladder problem, and incidentally, we see something in their other kidney. Uh, and so that's uh, why we're picking up more and more of these because of use of ultrasounds and uh, CT scans. Mainly in the uh, sixth and seventh decades of life, mainly in males, uh, three to two male to female incidence. And most of these are picked up incidentally, as we mentioned, and locally, uh, local disease. That means they're not spread anywhere. So localized cancer, as Dr. Buckman was saying, is just in the organ where it starts. And if it's metastatic cancer, that means it's already spread beyond the kidney uh, into other areas such as the lung or the uh, liver or, or various other areas. But most of the time we pick them up locally in about 60 to 70 percent of the time. Regionally, that means you have lymph nodes by the kidney that are involved about 15 to 20 percent of the time. And metastatic disease is about 15 to 20 percent of the time. That means we pick it up we, with a kidney mass and we see spots in the lungs or the, uh, or the uh, liver and about 15 to 20 percent of the time. So most of them are localized, but uh, a certain percentage, about uh, a fifth or a third, are uh, metastatic. Usually, again, these are picked up incidentally, but there are patients that have some symptoms. Hematuria is one of the uh, first signs. Hematuria is blood in the urine. So blood in the urine is always a bad sign. We had a patient the other day that uh, had blood in the urine for about three years. Um, and I would say that if you're peeing blood for three years, that's a sign you should see somebody. Um, so uh, he didn't, and, uh, but we were able to unfortunately uh, be able to fix his uh, tumor and, and cure it. Weakness, weight loss, if you have some weight loss of what's unexplained. If you're working out uh, 10 times a, a day, then that's probably a good reason to have weight loss. But if you have unintended weight loss, that's really a concern you need to see somebody about. Anemia, if you, have some, um, um, if you feel fatigued and it's due to a whole low hemoglobin, that could be a sign of something going on as well. If you have a fever of unknown origin, if you don't know why you have a fever and that's um, uh, for, you don't have a cold, as Dr. Buckman was saying, then you should look into that a bit more and see what's going on. But this hematuria, pain, and uh, feeling of mass is pretty rare, only about 10 to 15 percent. It's called this classic triad that we were taught in medical school. That's really going out the window a bit more, and we're picking up the majority of these by, by accident. So in terms of the anatomy of the kidney, in terms of where it is, I, I guess we should start off where the kidney is for those that don't know. So the kidney, uh, what the kidney functions to do is, uh, is uh, basically a washing machine for your blood. It cleans your, is it, it cleans your blood uh, and, and makes sure. And so uh, they sit in the back here, right by your back, behind all your bowels. So these are the, I think I have a laser pointer here. So these are your bowels in front. This is the front here, and the kidneys are in the back here. Uh, and um, so they're called retroperitoneal organs. That means they sit behind your bowels. And so when patients have pain in here, usually those aren't kidney-related pains because the kidneys are way in the back. So pains from the kidneys are, and I get this all the time, is pains in the side or in, uh, in maybe in the lower back. So those are sort of where the kidneys are. And so when you have a kidney stone, that's where you would have pain. But pain in your tummy uh, is not usually kidney-related. And when you have a solid mass in your kidney, uh, a growth in the kidney uh, almost uh, usually is a tumor if it's solid. Now, having said that, there can be, most of the time, there are benign, benign spots in the kidney, such as cysts uh, or benign growth, such as uh, an angiomyelopoma or fatty growth. And so the tumors themselves are when they're only solid. If there are solid growths in the kidney, then those are solid, and those are tumors. And so this is an example of where it would be if you're lying for surgery. Uh, the kidney would be in the side here on the flank. Uh, and uh, just underneath the rib cage, and so high up just underneath this area here. So if it is a solid growth in the kidney, then almost 95% chance it's a tumor. So if you can have clear water cysts in the kidney, and this is really what we see most of the time as urologists in our clinic, the family doctor sends us in with something in the kidney, and they say, oh my God, what is it? Is this a, a cancer, the word, not a sentence? Uh, and you, you say, well, what is that exactly? Well, most of the time it's just a cyst. It could be just a fluid-filled sac that you get in your, in your ovary or in your uh, liver, and if it's just clear water and you can see through it, then that's almost always benign. If it's solid and it's filled with stuff, then that's almost always cancer. 
So because of the high chance of malignancy, unless it's a very tiny mass, we don't usually biopsy it. If, it's, if we biopsy the mass, if it's large, biopsy the mass if it's small enough that we're not sure. But if it's a large mass, then we're almost sure that it's a tumor, we don't biopsy it. Because of the risk of a biopsy, there's a risk of bleeding, there's a risk of perhaps spreading the tumor. Uh, those are very rare risks, but we don't do it unnecessarily because of such a high chance of it being a cancer. If you do biopsy it and it comes back negative, then we don't know where to go. We say, well, you know, what if they missed it? So because of that reason, uh, for patients that come in with the localized tumor of their kidney, we don't advise against routine biopsy unless it's a small mass uh, because of the high chance of being a cancer. And we recommend, really, surgical removal because that's your best chance for cure. Just a bit about staging of, the, of kidney cancer. There are some nice um, uh, pamphlets out in the back there to, uh, to go over. But just to basically describe it, if the tumor is less than 7 centimeters, then that's a T1 lesion or a stage 1 lesion. We've now broken that up into 0 to 4 centimeters and 4 to 7. But anything less than 7 centimeters is, is considered an early tumor. And the five-year survival for or cure for that is very high. If it's greater than 7 centimeters, that's a bigger tumor, and uh, that's classified as a T2 or a stage 2 tumor. Uh, and the survival rate, if it has to metastasize, is still very, very high just by removal of that tumor as long as it hasn't spread. Now, stage 3 tumors are when the tumor goes into the vein uh, or into a local lymph node so, or to the, um, uh, into the adrenal gland. So if it's a local tumor here that's just in the kidney, if it's into the vein that uh, drains the kidney, then that will be a T3 uh, tumor or a stage 3 tumor. And if it's into the adrenal gland as well, which is on top of the kidney like a hat, uh, the adrenal gland functions for blood pressure control and so on, that's also a stage 3 tumor. Now if the tumor goes beyond outside the kidney into the fat around the kidney, uh, or into the regional lymph nodes uh, that you can actually see them, uh, then that is a stage four cancer, and that's advanced cancer. And that's where we have to uh, look at combinations of surgery and some of the new agents such as uh, uh, sunitinib or serafinib or uh, temsorolimus, and we'll, uh, Dr. Knox is going to talk about that later on today. But sometimes when you have uh, lymph nodes involved or spread of the cancer, that's when you talk about those uh, targeted agents to treat the cancer with or without surgery. We can talk more about that later on. Just a little bit about the types of cancer that are out there. Most of the cancers are what's called clear cell cancers. Uh, and um, then we also have, the second most common is papillary type 1 and papillary type 2. So these are what they look like. And in terms of the genes that are involved, uh, the von Hippel-Lindau gene is involved with clear cell. Uh, the MET gene is involved with papillary. Uh, and um, uh, we can uh, test for these as, as well through uh, some genetic tests uh, for those that um, have family histories of these kind of cancers. Chromophobe, and a chromophobe is a, a, a associated with berthog dubé syndrome, uh, and that has a very good prognosis if that's a type of tumor that's been removed. Benign tumors include oncocytoma, and more nasty tumors, which are uh, fortunately very rare, are collecting duct cancers and sarcomatoid cancers. And those are sort of the gamut of uh, various types of kidney cancers that uh, can be removed. And you can determine that type with a biopsy beforehand. But usually, we, again, for localized disease, we remove it and then deal with it afterwards when the pathology report comes as to how we're going to uh, adjust uh, treatment and follow-up options. So in terms of the surgery, there is uh, radical nephrectomy, which is removal of the entire kidney, partial nephrectomy, which is removal of just the tumor and saving the kidney, cryoablation, which is freezing it, radiofrequency ablation, which is burning it, and surveillance, which is actually not a surgical option, but I put that up there, uh, which means just watching it. And we're not going to talk a lot about active surveillance, but Dr. Jewett is actually one of the pioneers in the world uh, in active surveillance, and uh, he should be commended for the work he's done to uh, pioneer that in the world. So in terms of um, uh, the nephrectomy, the traditional nephrectomy is through a, uh, uh, a flank incision, an incision to the side here or an incision uh, in, your, in the middle of your tummy. And that's what we used to do for many of these cancers, and we still do for larger cancers. Uh, but it's a, it's a pretty uh, substantial incision in the side, uh, and it uh, takes about uh, four to six weeks to recover from that in the hospital for about uh, a week or so. And sometimes they have to have a, a piece of rib removed. So we don't do that as much now because we've uh, approached things laparoscopically now. So in terms of laparoscopic approach to nephrectomy, I'm going to show some um, videos and pictures, so if anybody's queasy, you might want to leave. Uh, but hopefully, you won't be too queasy from this, But because we haven't had lunch yet. But th this is uh, the positioning for a surgery. We go into the side in the flank position, uh, and um, uh, we uh, tape, the, uh, tape the patient down so they don't 
fall off the bed because that would be a disaster. Um, that's never happened, um, as far as I know, to anybody. Uh, and then uh, we put a tube into the a mouth for a breathing machine, uh, as well as padding along these areas here, because when you're asleep, you can't tell uh, which areas hurt or not. So we always put lots of pillows and padding uh, to uh, pad the um, uh, pressure points. This is an example of the, uh, uh, how it looks in real life in the surgical suite. Uh, we put a, a warm blanket on top to keep the, uh, the chest warm and the head warm and again taped down quite securely uh, to make sure nobody rolls off. And then we go in through the belly button first and, and we do these laparoscopic procedures. We put in a little needle at the belly button just to fill up the belly with gas so that we can see inside and we use this little needle that goes in and then once you put that needle in, a blunt tip comes out underneath it so that it protects the bowel underneath so there's a little risk to the organs underneath the uh, skin. And then we use uh, these, these fancy instruments, uh, laparoscopic instruments, to uh, look in terms of what we're doing. And this is an example of what's called an OptiView. Maybe we could turn some of, some of the back lights out uh, if there's any lights we can turn out just to see these videos a bit more. And this is an example of how we look inside. So we're putting this, um, uh, this port in, and this is a camera that goes through this, and we look inside through the muscle layers uh, and through the skin, and we go right into the belly, and then we can see uh, everything underneath, and this is all the bowel and everything else underneath there. So by looking directly, there's less risk of injury uh, to the organs underneath. And then we use these, these, these keyhole surgery, those laparoscopic instruments to uh, do the surgery and remove the kidney. In order to do that, as we saw in the first picture, uh, your uh, bowel and everything, your liver is all in front of the kidney. So what we have to do is we have to move those things out of the way. So we move the spleen out of the way, we move the stomach out of the way, uh, we move the bowel out of the way, the colon, and then we get into the retroperitoneum by um, uh, getting the kidney behind all these organs. This is an example of that. This is the adrenal gland on top of the kidney. This is the kidney here. The spleen's flipped over, uh, the bowel's flip, flipped over, and uh, no cause for alarm. We put those all back when we're done. Um, we don't leave them flipped. And then what we do is we take these, these vessels uh, with uh, secure stapling devices. And many patients are concerned saying, well, what if those clips come off? Well, this, this clip applier is like a sewing machine. It, it lays a row of clips down like a sewing machine through the vessels. So the, there are little tiny clips that go through there and it sews it down so it can't open up afterwards. It's okay for airports. The metal detectors do not go off from this stuff, and uh, there's no problem with that. You can go through all, I get that all the time about, can I go through an MRI, can I go through airports? It's really not a problem. They're just little tiny pieces of metal that stay there permanently. We do that for the artery and the vein. Again, there's an artery that feeds a kidney and a vein that drains a kidney, and we use these stapling devices to secure these vessels, and then we just pluck out that kidney. How do we pluck it out? Well, there's a couple of ways to pluck it out. One is, is, uh, is to, uh, so we put it into a bag, first of all, because the cancer is enclosed in the kidney, so we don't want to spill any cells anywhere. So we put it into this baggie. It's basically just a sandwich baggie that costs $500. And we put it into this uh, sandwich baggie, uh, and we take it out through, through, the, through the skin. Now, there's two ways to take it out. One is you could just put a little surgical blender in there, which also costs about $3,000, and then blend it up and take it out like a soup. Um, or you can take it out by making the incision a little bit bigger. The reason why we have to make the incision a little bit bigger and take it out in tax is because we need to know what kind of cancer it is. And when you have this soup, you don't really know what the staging is, what kind of cancer it is, and whether it was into the vein or not because it's all just a mishmash. It looks way better afterwards, uh, but you really do need to have the kidney out. So people come to the, when they have big tumors, they come afterwards and says, well, doc, I thought you did it laparoscopically. I got this, you know, this, this incision this big where you took it out. Well, it's because the kidney is that big. And sometimes it's that big, we have to take it out somehow. And that's why we do it that way. So we don't usually morselate, and most cancer surgeons in, in North America now don't morselate this or, or, or blend it out because of the uh, lack of staging data, as well as really don't want the blender to go through the bag and spill it all over your belly. So we always take it out uh, through the baggie. This is the baggie again, and this is arrows for those surgeons that don't know, uh, so they don't know exactly which direction to put it into the bag. And then we take it out through one of these incisions. So this is what it looks like at the end of the operation. We have these laparoscopic ports. Uh, and you can see now everything looks beautiful, but now we have to take that uh, kidney out. And so we have to make it a little bit bigger. So we're able to squeeze these tumors out uh, through these small incisions uh, quite uh, uh, c capably. And because it's in a bag, there's no chance of any uh, spillage inside the belly. Uh, and there's no chance of any seeding of, this, of the port side because it's all enclosed uh, with this little uh, cinch down as well. So everything's inside there and there's nothing spilled. 
This is an example of what the pathologist gets. Again, the tumor is inside right in here, but there's a layer of fat on top of the kidney. And this is exactly what you want because you don't want any of the cancer cells spilling anywhere um, during the surgery or in the baggie. And these are the examples of what happens afterwards. Uh, nice recovery from these laparoscopic surgeries. Um, and uh, in this patient, we took it out through a little bikini incision. Uh, I didn't want to show that uh, for her modesty's sake, but it's always nice to have that uh, sort of uh, back to the beach kind of look. And there are certain types of cancers that do require uh, a large incision in order to remove it properly. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the um, um, new innovative uh, areas that we're involved with uh, in, um, in Canada. Uh, and uh, one of the things is the robot. It's kind of a cool robot. And if anybody has uh, $5 million, we could use it to buy one. It's very cheap. Um, and uh, this is that the, you can do these surgeries laparoscopically or robotically. And this is an example of the robot uh, doing the surgery. And you say, well, where's the surgeon? The surgeon's actually off on the side on the robotic console uh, doing the surgery. So um, I, won't, I won't go through all the data just to, uh, so I don't bore you. But again, the, the, the key question to remember is that removing just the tumor uh, is exactly the same cure rate as removing the entire kidney. We have data for tumors that are T1 or stage 1. We don't actually have a lot of data for a larger tumor. So for larger tumors, we still recommend having the entire kidney removed. But, but for tumors that are less than 7 centimeters, we recommend just removal of the, of the tumor itself. And the most important thing is that as we all age, we need that kidney function uh, to preserve uh, for, for long term. So having one and a half kidneys is always better than just having one kidney. So the next step in the evolution of the surgical approaches is doing everything through the belly button without any uh, incisions at all. And this is called single port surgery, and I'll just go through this briefly as well. And this is all <clears throat> basically belly button surgery you've read about in the news. And we're doing some of these surgeries as well. And basically we put all these ports in at the belly button and do all the surgery through that. In order to do that, <clears throat> we need these, um, I'll just call them bendy instruments. These are instruments that bend and curve in order to do the surgery. And we have these new fiber optic cameras that are able to bend down and look at the tumor and bend up and able to do the surgery all through the belly button. And there's various devices on the market now, such as the uh, triport. And these are all just various ports that go in at the belly button in order to do the surgery. This is the one we use in Hamilton called the Sills port. And again, we all go. Through, this is um, a, a schematic of going through the belly button and doing the surgery through that, uh, and then taking out the uh, tumor through the belly button. This is an example of the, one of the surgeries that we did uh, in Hamilton. Uh, we make an incision at the belly button. Uh, we put this uh, uh, little um, port in through the belly button there, and then once it's in, we put the gas in to insufflate the abdomen and make up all the gas in the belly. Then we put all these various ports in here as well, and then we put all the instruments in through there in order to do the surgery. We were able to put the bag in through the belly button. This, this is the, towards the end of the operation, putting this uh, expensive bag into the belly button. And then we take it out through, the, through this here. We have to make it a little bit bigger again just to, in order to get this out properly. But it can be fairly, uh, fairly small incisions in the end. And these are the kind of results you get afterwards for those that want to go uh, to the beach right away. And you can see here, you get the tumors out uh, with, with a negative margin. Uh, I don't know why they put me in there, but it's supposed to be just the kidney. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the kidney with a negative margin, all enclosed in fat with no signs of any spillage. Uh, and um, again, no obvious scars for recovery. Uh, and it also helps not just cosmetically, but helps in terms of uh, getting um, out of the hospital sooner within a few days and back to work sooner as well. So this is coming to, to North America now. It's uh, being done in the States a lot. We're now doing it in Canada and meet in a lot of centers. Uh, and it's definitely uh, uh, something that's um, uh, uh, feasible in terms of through the belly button surgery. Um, in terms of advantages, uh, it's more expensive for the taxpayer um, and uh, may not have a lot of advantage over pure laparoscopic surgery, but uh, it uh, may have some benefit and the studies are still out as to the complete benefits of doing it through the belly button. So just going to touch on, um, uh, to finish off, talking about burning and freezing technologies. Um, we, as we go through this last part of it, though, I, I want you to remember that the best cure for any cancer is always removal. Surgery is always the best cure. These freezing and burning technologies are still in their infancy. We have some data on them, uh, and they are recommended for certain types of patients, uh, but we'll go through that um, at the end of it here as well as in the discussion period. 
So um, fire or ice, why? So there are some patients that are not really good candidates for surgery, usually older patients that uh, are unable to have a, a longer anesthetic or unable to tolerate the, uh, the rigors of, a, of the laparoscopic surgery. So we can put the needle in through the side percutaneously uh, or laparoscopically through a quick one hour laparoscopic operation and put a probe in there and either freeze it or burn it. So it's an outpatient procedure, they go home the same day. So we did a result of which one's better, uh, sorry, analysis of which one's better, and they're both pretty much the same, but we don't have long-term data on it. Uh, but there's a suggestion that freezing it may be better than burning it uh, in terms of uh, outcomes. We also looked at our experience with regards to whether you should do it laparoscopically or percutaneously. Certainly percutaneous is better, definitely, definitely better for the patient to have you put in through the side and then you go home the same evening, whereas laparoscopic, you're still in hospital for a day or two afterwards, even though it's a shorter operation. The key thing here is that when you, when you remove the tumor laparoscopically or with an incision uh, to get rid of it surgically, it's all gone. So you still have to have follow-up afterwards to make sure that it doesn't come back, uh, but it's, it's out of there. With regards to this, these technologies, you're basically, it's, the mass is still there, but you've frozen it, you've burned it, and you're crossing your fingers that all the cells are dead inside. So the concern with RFA and cryoablation is uh, we prefer surgery first, and RFA uh, burning or freezing is only as a secondary for those patients that cannot have, have surgery. Looks very promising, and we're still trying to figure out how long to freeze for, uh, how many cycles to burn for, and that's, so I would say it's still investigational, but for those patients, such as an 85-year-old patient that cannot have an anesthetic, uh, doing this technology is excellent. Along those lines, we now have a trial open where, uh, where we have funding to look at burning versus freezing for small masses, and we've now had approval for this trial, and uh, for those patients that are interested, uh, uh, that we can, you can contact me at my email, uh, and that's the email. So in conclusion, we've talked a little bit about laparoscopic, radical, partial nephrectomy, robotic surgery, single port surgery, cryo, and RFA. I haven't talked about active surveillance a lot, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in the uh, question and answer session. But basically, we have a huge gamut of ways to cure the patient uh, with localized disease of their kidney. Thanks very much. Okay, the question from the, for the first question was, um, uh, do you ever wait for a kidney tumor to grow from two centimeters to three centimeters, and does it make it easier to manage? And what we're saying is that uh, the small renal mass is usually less than three centimeters, uh, and it may be benign, so there's about a two-thirds chance it's a tumor and a one-third chance it's not a tumor. So often we just keep an eye on things, and if it does grow, then that's a sign that something's brewing and it should be removed. So if it, if it is growing, then we'd recommend either uh, burning it, freezing it, or removing it, um, because it means something is happening there if it's growing. The second question was, um, what makes a patient suitable for single port surgery, uh, and is it offered in Toronto? Uh, it's unfortunately not, off, not offered in Toronto yet, unlike, unlike most things in Canada. Uh, but right now it's not in Toronto. It's in, an, it's in uh, Alberta as well as in Hamilton and uh, in Halifax. Um, um, but we'll take anybody. The, um, and who, who's suitable for a single port surgery? Right now it's, um, it's uh, patients that are a little bit thinner. Um, and the reason why is just that the kidney is way up in here and your belly button's way down here. So if you're a very large person, we don't have long enough instruments yet. So we're developing those. So, um, but overall, it's uh, a relative, and it's just a, a thinner person. But otherwise, it's um, anybody can have that as long as we have long enough, long enough instruments. What's the ideal warm ischemic time for partial nephrectomy? That's an excellent question. And uh, usually it's about 30 minutes. So we like to, um, I mean, when you're clamping the artery, uh, and there's no blood going to the kidney, and it's sitting there while you're cutting out the tumor, um, the blood is sitting in the kidney, and it can just clot off. So you have a certain amount of time to do your surgery uh, before it's, it's, not, it's too long. And so 30, 30 minutes is the average time. Anything beyond 35 to 40 minutes is uh, when the blood in the kidney starts to clot, and that's when um, it's, it's too long. So 30 minutes is the average time for a partial nephrectomy. What is the medication you give your patient after surgery of kidney cancer and for how long? Uh, well, that's a question about adjuvant therapy, and Dr. Knox uh, talked about um, uh, the fact that we don't have a lot about... Well, they gave it to me. Can you okay. <laughs> She's always like that. <laughs> We're both uh, uh, chairs of the kidney uh, at the NCIC, and she's always bossing me around. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Uh, anyway, so there's a trial uh, which randomizes uh, serafinib versus sunitinib versus placebo. And the Assure trial is offered in most uh, centers in Canada. And so right after surgery, now the standard of care is just to cross your fingers, uh, no matter what size of the tumor. Um, but uh, we're thinking that giving a medication for six months to a year after the surgery may help. And this Assure trial will, be, will give us that answer. So this is, this is better. Is there any disadvantage to shrinking a large tumor with drugs prior to surgery? So that's a good question about neoadjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant therapy is giving a course of drug for a few months or weeks before surgery to try and shrink it down to make the surgery um, easier uh, or to kill any um, cells that may be brewing inside the body that we can't see. Um, and that's an excellent question, and that's actually an area of, uh, of my personal interest. We do a lot of neoadjuvant studies, uh, and right now, though, the standard of care is just to go into surgery and get the thing out. Um, um, so right now, we don't have a lot of information about neoadjuvant therapy uh, in localized cancer. So if somebody has a localized tumor, no matter what size, the standard is to get it out as soon as possible. But if somebody has metastatic disease, giving you a course of drug before the surgery may be helpful, and we don't really know that answer yet. Is my five minutes up yet, or still go? Keep going. One more question. Okay. Um, I feel like David Letterman should go like this. <laughs> um, Dr. Kapoor, could you comment on what part of the patient has or should have in selecting the type of surgery that to be used? Is it a medical decision, or uh, does the patient have any say? Well, the obvious answer to that is the patient has all the say. It's the patient's decision as to what uh, what should be done. But we make recommendations, and so if at all possible, we'd recommend a partial nephrectomy, a nephron-sparing approach, because of everything you've heard today, that trying to save as many good kidney cells is good um, for long-term survival uh, and health and kidney health. So we would always recommend a partial nephrectomy if at all possible. If it's not possible, then we have to do a radical nephrectomy. Having said that, though, there are cases where we do recommend a total removal um, because it's quicker. So if somebody is 80 years old or 85 years old and they have a tumor in their kidney uh, and they're somewhat frail, we can do the surgery to remove the entire kidney in about an hour, whereas to remove laparoscopically and to remove the, the partial takes about three hours. So in that frail older patient, it may be better just to go in there and get it out quickly rather than try and save the nephrons, whereas when they're 80, 85, they'll be fine on their one kidney for the rest of their life. So. But the, the answer is it's uh, always a patient decision as to, and we just give you the information.